Hey everyone, Turd Flinging Monkey, how's it going? So I want to take a moment to explain why I even went down this rabbit hole in the first place regarding solutions when MGTOW isn't about reform, but abandonment of marriage and gynocentric society. I'm not trying to reform the system. I'm merely attempting to bring some of our community's collective intellectual muscle to bear on the larger problems, the problems that created gynocentric society in the first place. When you take a step back and look at MGTOW, it's easy to see it as little more than a group of YouTube channels talking about feminism and marriage. But it's more than that. I'm not saying that it can be more than that, it already is more than that. Think about how entrenched and ingrained feminism and gynocentrism has become. This makes the MGTOW community the last place for discussion about topics that haven't been tainted by political correctness, tone policing, and gynocentric concern for women's feels. You have Marcus from the channel Groundwork for the Metaphysics of MGTOW, which discusses philosophy and how it relates to MGTOW. You have Dark Knight, a MGTOW with a scientific background talking about genetics and mental health and how those relate to MGTOW. You have Nico Chosky, who's an actual no-shit doctor of mental health and a member of the MGTOW community, who relates his medical knowledge as well as his personal experiences and insights to help men. Finally, although I could keep going, you have Black Gnostic Speaks, who goes into how esoteric knowledge relates to MGTOW and human nature. All of these channels primarily focus on gynocentrism, male-female dynamics, not getting married, etc. You know, the bread and butter MGTOW stuff that is vital to our community. But they also delve into topics that are tangentially related to MGTOW, but are more about science, medicine, philosophy, economics, politics, etc. These subjects may not have the direct benefit of waking men up to the red pill, However, digesting the red pill is somewhat of a one-time event. Your eyes are opened, you see the true world you live in, but then the question inevitably comes, now what do I do? I personally feel that serving the existing MGTOW community by increasing our collective knowledge is almost as important as the work of waking new men up to the gynocentric world we live in. The latter grows our community, but the former strengthens our community. So, with all that said, I want to respond to one of the most common comments I received from my previous video regarding my proposed solution for a non-gynocentric dynamic for relationships and families. I'm not going to respond to anyone specifically, but a common concern in the comments section was in regards to my intent. Why was I bothering with this discussion at all within MGTOW, when MGTOW isn't about reform, but abandoning the system altogether? So let me explain my intent by expanding on something I call the traditionalism cycle. And here we go. So I created this infographic and I'll talk through it and explain how MGTOW relates to both abandoning the current system, but should also be concerned with influencing the system which will inevitably follow. So starting at the top of the cycle we have traditionalism, which I define as the state wherein women are more or less the property of men, men have authority over their wives, Women are to submit to men, namely their husbands, and the laws explicitly favor men. This is essentially the point where civilization began thousands and thousands of years ago. This is considered a barbaric state of mankind, and this state really only exists in very primitive societies, or in ad hoc societies that form in the vacuum of anarchy. Gynocentrism is the second state, and is defined by me as a state wherein women are protected, men are made to be responsible for the provision, protection, and behavior of women, and men are encouraged to sacrifice themselves to further the society in the name of honor, duty, obligation, or manhood. Gynocentrism is what separates very savage and primitive societies from civilized and advanced societies. The more technologically advanced the society, the more gynocentric. Gynocentrism and technology have a symbiotic relationship that creates a positive feedback loop, and eventually leads to feminism, but I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Societies become gynocentric for two reasons. The first being the most obvious, that women make babies. And making babies is extremely important for a society to grow and thrive in a world where other societies are competing for scarce resources. Women are the limiting factor of reproduction, and so society has a vested interest in making sure they are protected and reproducing. The flip side is that while women are being protected, there are dangerous and life-threatening tasks that need to be done for the good of society. Someone needs to build the walls, defend the villages, and go to war. Since women are protected, it falls upon men to do these dangerous jobs. 
and society rewards men with resources and status, if they survive of course, which allows them to acquire women for reproduction. Now at this point, women are still basically the property of men, but the dynamic has shifted from that of a master and a slave to that more of a parent and a child. While the slave master may care nothing for the slave, and only provides as little provision as necessary to get what they want out of them. The relationship between parent and child is about responsibility as much as it is about authority. While parents have authority over their children, they are also responsible for their behavior. If a child destroys someone's property, the parents will have to pay for it. Society also doesn't permit parents to abuse or murder their children for the most part. In this same way, women began to enjoy increased rights and protections in relation to men, and since they were still under men's authority, they avoided responsibility for their actions. This system continues more or less the same as long as the economy is primarily agricultural, meaning that most of the work is done on farms and technology is limited. This is because only men have the physical strength and endurance to work, meaning that women are left to assist the man by doing what he doesn't have time to do, namely domestic duties such as cooking, cleaning, and the rearing of children. Men would most often work from sunrise to sunset, and since children increased the amount of workers who could assist the man on the farm, families were as large as possible, keeping both men and women busy. The turning point happens when a society goes from an agricultural to an industrial economy, when work goes from primarily being back-breaking physical labor to working on an assembly line or in an office. Numerous things are affected that change the society fundamentally. This is the state where feminism appears, which I define as the state wherein government welfare programs replace the requirement for direct provision from men. Women are liberated from their traditional responsibilities, while men are expected to maintain their responsibilities, and the laws are increasingly passed that benefit women at the expense of men. The modern bloated welfare state is the direct result of women's suffrage. I'm not saying that a country or society can't have some form of social insurance or welfare, but these systems explode and become unsustainable once women are allowed to vote, and they become a voting block. Women's natural emotional thinking bias means that rational arguments regarding the economic impact and viability of their demands goes right over their heads, and they perceive any attempt to reform or cut welfare as a threat to their livelihoods. This means that the welfare state becomes unsustainable and unreformable. It's a one-way street. Once women can vote, the slow death begins and cannot be stopped democratically. This leads from simply an anti-male bias in the laws to outright misandry and the enslavement of men to women. I'm linking to a video from Terrence Pop called System Surfers that shows that while the average man without a college degree makes about 1.2 million over the course of their life, the average woman abusing welfare and receiving child support can easily receive 2.4 million over the course of her life. Link in the description. In order for this system to be sustainable, you would need at least two men to work and pay taxes for every woman to break even. But these systems can't be sustained politically if women are only 33% of the population, making it a catch-22, which will eventually lead to the last state of our cycle. Economic collapse. It's coming. It's inevitable. Why? Because women are bad at math and they run the government, that's why. Three big causes of economic collapse. One, overburdened welfare state. Women take and take and take and any attempt to reason with them is considered an attack on women. You hate women if you try to cut welfare. You hate women if you don't give in to their demands. You can't even have accountability in welfare or you hate women. 2. Marriage Abandonment Men eventually realize marriage is a shitty deal. They have no authority, their wives can bend them over the couch and fuck them in divorce court at any time for any or no reason, and the government will force men to support their ex-wives for the rest of their life. During the gynocentric state, at least marriage provided some benefits to men to offset the costs and risks, but after the feminism state, that's been eroded to the point that marriage is suicidal. Now in the early stages, you may have a generation or two continue to get married more out of habit or social pressure than anything, but after a couple of generations of men see their fathers being raped in divorce court, and they see all these welfare queens with multiple kids from different men driving better cars than them, they throw their hands up and say, fuck this shit. Now you have MGTOW, but even without this movement, men would still be abandoning marriage anyway. Just as Marxism fuels but isn't the cause of feminism, MGTOW fuels but isn't the cause of marriage abandonment. Finally, you have the demographic winter. Less marriage means fewer children, means fewer taxpayers, means less revenue, 
means overburdened welfare system, means economic collapse. Once the collapse comes, the whole system resets back to traditionalism. Without the police and government to protect all these feminists and quote-unquote strong independent women, they will quickly, and I'm talking about within a month or even a week quickly, begin whoring themselves out to any man that will protect her and give her provision. Faced with their own death in the savage aftermath of a collapsed economy, they will gladly become the property of a man who will keep them alive. This may sound great for men, but remember that this state is temporary. As soon as civilization begins to stabilize the environment, and technology begins to advance and be implemented again, all of the same problems of gynocentrism and feminism reemerge and ends the same way. It's an endless cycle. Traditionalism, at the beginning when the environment is harshest and women are willing to do anything for survival. Then gynocentrism, when civilization begins to emerge and societies begin elevating the needs of the woman over the man. Then feminism, as industrialization allows women to make their own money, and gynocentric conditioning has taught men to pander to women's approval. And then ending in economic collapse, as women consume and destroy the institutions that men built to protect them. And then the cycle repeats again, and again, and again. The only way to break out of this cycle is at the traditionalism stage. If women are property, then men are responsible for them, and that leads directly to gynocentrism. If women are expected to be equal and contribute equally to men from the beginning, on what basis can gynocentrism take root? Feminism cannot exist without gynocentrism, and gynocentrism cannot take hold without traditionalism. It is precisely because women are treated as property during the traditionalism state that they are not expected to be responsible during the gynocentrism state. How can we break this cycle? Is it even possible to break this cycle? I don't know. I gave some ideas in my last video regarding a relationship dynamic on decentralized equality, but they were merely ideas about a system that could work. I have no idea how to get there or even if getting there is possible. I do know that the MGTOW community has more wisdom, knowledge, and intelligence than any one person could have alone. And if there is a way to break this cycle, the answer will come from this community. John Locke and Adam Smith were not politicians, but merely philosophers during the 17th and 18th centuries. They did not actively seek to change the world, but merely by sharing their ideas they greatly influenced the men that would become known as the Founding Fathers of the United States, whose government experiment would serve as an example for the rest of the world. In our feminist culture of political correctness, this is the last stand of free thought, and who knows how far our ideas may go and who they might influence along the way. Well, that's it for this video. I hope you liked it. Please like, favorite, comment, and subscribe. Share this video with anyone you think it might help, and I'll see you next time.